We're going to now talk about uh, how we can use complementary slackness as the key tool to deriving a, an iterative algorithm that goes back and forth between the primal and the dual. So let me tell you the basic framework. Uh, and, and again, this is, this is what I'm going to describe right now in this lecture. Um, we will specialize this to many different combinatorial problems, shortest path, max flow, and min cut, and, and, and later and more sophisticated version uh, matching. Um, in order, um, it, we're, we're going to specialize it and see how we can, how we can solve uh, those problems. So uh, the basic concept is straightforward. Um, let's write um, the main idea is if I have a primal dual feasible pair, so I'll just write if X and P are primal dual PD feasible, and it so happens that complementary slackness, I'll just write CS for short, um, holds, then we know uh, that we are at an optimal solution. So we've seen that in a previous, uh, in a previous lecture. So the primal dual algorithm has a simple idea. It says, let's um, leave aside the objective and let's just try to find a primal dual feasible solution where complementary slackness holds. And the key idea is that when complementary slackness fails to hold, it will give us a tool to improve, to keep improving our dual solution. So this is properly a, a, a dual algorithm because we are going to be maintaining a dual feasibility throughout um, as opposed to primal feasibility. Okay, so uh, the, the primal dual algorithm idea is, is then um, we start with a dual feasible P and then try to find an X that shows that that P is optimal. Namely, try to find an X which satisfies complementary slackness to satisfy complementary slackness. And if we cannot, use this failure to do so, to update P to a better in terms of objective value, so that would be larger because we're maximizing, uh, better, and I should write, and always feasible, we're always maintaining dual feasibility, uh, dual solution P. And, um, the kind of key is that this update, now this is like a meta algorithm. It's generally applicable. And for a generic problem, it's not always clear why these sub steps, which you're going to see uh, in the next slides and in, in, the, in the next lectures, uh, these sub steps are going to involve solutions to linear programs. So it's not always a priori obvious why, where the algorithmic win is. And it's not always there in a you know, completely general general way. But in many situations, this update, and, and the situations that are of most interest to us, the update is often an easy subproblem to solve. Okay, so let's see some of these uh, details. Again, we start with a dual feasible value P. What does that mean? Dual feasible means that P transpose A is less than C transpose. I want this to satisfy complementary slackness. That means that if P transpose AJ is strictly less than CJ, I must enforce that XJ is equal to zero. So let's write out, let's use capital J, sometimes called uh, the admissible columns. This is jargon. 
let's just let's say let's write j is equal to all the indices it's the index set where p transpose a j is exactly equal to c j so what is j in, not, in, in other words j is the set of x's that are allowed to be non-zero in a solution that satisfies complementary slackness it could also be zero but they but they could be positive whereas for any little j that's not in this set of admissible columns if you're hoping to satisfy complementary slackness x that x little j must equal zero so i think if i write it out you'll you'll you'll, you'll see what i'm saying this is exactly what's called the um restricted primal problem so again let me note um x j must equal zero for all j not in j for complementary slackness to hold so the restricted primal problem abbreviated rp is to minimize something remember we're, we're, we don't care about the objective so you're not going to see our original c appear here and i need to introduce some some auxiliary variables because before I write this objective, let's well, let's let's write this. So the objective is a sum of some auxiliary variables. I would love for these to be zero. I'm writing superscript a to denote auxiliary, and my constraints are that the sum over j in j of a i j x j plus x i a is equal to b i. Another way to write this, I'm not sure if it's, if, it's, if it's more transparent or not, is saying A subscript J, I'm picking out only the columns that correspond to J, times XJ, this is exactly the same way we had A subscript B, capital B for basis, plus XA is equal to B. So auto, right here, I'm already enforcing, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm already enforcing that uh, xj is equal to zero for any little j that's not in the that's not admissible um, and I've just even removed them from from that equation so my xj's have to be non-negative and certainly my auxiliary variables uh, are non-negative and uh, xj complement is equal to zero okay, so th th these I, I just remove these from the equation so they they um, they don't appear so note that if I solve this if my objective is equal to zero then stop then stop we have found X that satisfies complementary slackness with our dual variable, which started us off in this process, p. Um, so, if if we if we have zero as, as as an objective, then we're in business. We've succeeded. So we're interested in understanding what happens when we do not have zero. Okay. So let's so let's assume that we have uh, that 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 this is uh, that this is not the case. What are we going to do? Well, if we solve this restricted primal with the simplex method, we know that we've also solved the dual of this. So let's write out what the dual is. The dual is maximize P transpose B. So I'm just going to write it, but please go back and verify for yourselves that this is, that this is indeed the dual. Subject to P transpose a j equals zero for every j in my admissible set. P less than one. See, where did that come from? That's m constraints here. Where did that, that wasn't there before. And otherwise, the pi are free. So if we compare this to the dual, we see uh, two differences. One is that we have P transpose a j equals zero, not c. Again, c is, is gone from this completely. And P is less than or equal to one. So those are the two uh, new elements. Again, note that C is not present here. 
Um, and sometimes we're going to talk about this more in later lectures that we've say we say that we have co combinatorialized the cost. The cost is, is not there. We've, re we've replaced it with something structural, namely the all zeros um, vector. So note that if the optimal value of uh, the restricted primal is positive, then certainly the dual to the restricted primal will also have a positive value. What is the now what we're going to do, so let's let P bar be the dual solution, the solution to the dual restricted problem. And the last thing we'll do uh, in this lecture is show how we can use that to update the original dual variable. So again, P bar is the solution to our dual restricted problem. And I'm going to let, uh, in the spirit of the original simplex method, I'm going to update P by moving from where I was, P, in the direction of P bar for some theta greater than or equal to zero. And so now the question is, how, how do we choose theta? Well, in the primal simplex method, we choose theta. We choose how far we move in the D direction. We move in, in order to maintain primal feasibility. Exactly the same thing here. So we choose, but, but for dual feasibility. So we choose theta so that P plus theta P bar transpose, my, my new P times A is less than or equal to C. That's dual feasibility. I wanna maintain that. Okay, so let's uh, see what that means. Um, if I have, j in the admissible set, I already had p transpose, I already had p transpose aj equal to cj. So that doesn't leave me much wiggle room for theta, right? Except now you see that I have, if, if you recall, I, I guess I should have put this on this slide, let me just flip back a second. For all of those, um, I made a mistake here, I'm very sorry. Uh, this should be less than or equal to. Right? So. If we, if we were to write out the original dual problem, I guess I have to go back to a previous lecture, but it would be, it would be less than or equal to zero. And, and that's again what I have here. It's because of non-negativity of, of all of the variables that we have that. Um, so for J and J, I, I already have this, so I have no, no wiggle room for theta, but luckily the dual, restricted, the dual of the restricted primal problem imposes that P transpose a j is less than or equal to zero. So I'm good there. I can add multiples of theta and I'm not going to uh, hurt my, my, uh, my constraint, my dual feasibility constraint. So that means all I need to worry about, so what, what does it say? So all theta are good here. So all I need to worry about is what happens for j that's not in j. Here it's possible uh, oh, so what did I have? So for these, I had P transpose AJ was strictly less than J for my, less, my last P. So I, I do have some wiggle room here. I can add some theta. Um, so if P transpose, if, if my P bar, my solution to the dual variable, happens to be positive, that is going to give me a finite bound. If all of my P bar transpose AJ are non-negative, non-positive, then I, can, then I can go infinitely far in theta. But otherwise, so if this is true, then we have a bound on theta. And in particular, we're gonna choose theta in a way that's exactly reminiscent to what we did in primal and dual uh, simplex. We basically choose theta by looking at the minimum over all j in the non-admissible set, so j in J complement such that P bar transpose AJ is positive. We look at the ratio of the reduced cost divided by, sorry, this is the old P, it's not P bar, divided by P bar transpose AJ. And What's going to happen is that that reduced cost is basically going to be brought um, 
is going to be brought to zero, but also it's, uh, it means that um, this is going to decide a new element of j for which p transpose aj is going to be equal to cj. So it's going to introduce a new, uh, a new element um, into the admissible set. So uh, this is going to give a, a j nu. But also note that this improves, this improves the dual. Since P nu transpose B is equal to P plus theta P bar transpose B, which is equal to what I had before, P transpose B, that's my old value. And now some positive value times P bar transpose B. And this is positive. Why is it positive? It's positive because of strong duality. It's positive because this is the optimal value of the dual restricted problem, which is equal to the optimal value of the restricted, uh, restricted primal of RP. And RP must be positive, otherwise we're in business. Otherwise we were already at an optimal solution. So here we have another way going between primal and dual and using complementary slackness as our key tool to have to not require C except for this essentially trivial way at the end where we decide theta, where we continuously update our theta. We're solving subproblems that have C nowhere in sight. This is why it's, we say that we've combinatorialized it. We're going to, in the next lecture, look at properties of the primal dual algorithm show that it is an algorithm that's finite, so it's guaranteed to terminate. And, beyond, and after that, we're going to start looking at uh, specific examples of how primal dual is used. So we will pick this up next time.